Welcome to the Lifestyle Chase. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. Proudly hosted by me, Chris Little. Without further ado, let's get started. All right. So, welcome to episode six of the Lifestyle Chase. I have with me today the one, the only, Lane Mitchell from Sonic 1029. Thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me. So, how's your day going? Pretty good so far. Nice. So, uh, tell me and the listeners, what's a day in the life of Lane like? How do you start out your day? Um, well, I usually get up and have a giant breakfast. (laughs) (laughs) Um, my daughter and I, she's three, you know, get her fed and that sort of thing. We usually have a quick dip in the hot tub, get her to a day home. And then, uh, I hit the gym. Nice. What's your routine look like? Walk us through your gym routine. Um, well, I, I sort of do four days a week. I I used to do more, but, uh, I find with being really busy, if I can sort of do longer days at the gym, it saves me an extra day of getting dressed and that sort of thing, right? Um, so I do chest and tries and abs and sprints on Monday, and then back and buys and abs and uh, half hour cardio on the bike on Tuesdays. Wednesdays I take off. Thursdays shoulders, traps, abs, and uh, half hour jog. And then Fridays all about the legs. That's nice. It. I like it. Uh, where's your favorite place in the city to work out at? Uh, Terwilliga Rec, usually. Nice. Yeah. That, they have the best reputation out of all the city gyms. Well, not the best, but they definitely have the good good reputation. Well, I only started doing the sprints maybe, what, a year ago? And uh, they've got a track there, so it's kind of nice that you can just go to one place and get all of it done. Totally. It helps. Um, so tell us about your journey into radio. Tell us a story. Hmm. Well, I was a hack musician, and uh, I sort of wanted a job in a studio, I guess, and I thought... I don't know, radios are studios. So, uh, <laughs> like radio stations are studios. So, yeah, I um, I just sort of fell into it backwards and wound up on the air. Nice. Like, uh, did you, what, what schooling route did you take? Uh, there was actually, um, I actually went to Saskatoon just to um, help my mom find a place to live. Uh, she was moving out there just temporarily to help out a friend. Went out there, and that woman's husband had mentioned something about how he had done radio in college, and there was a school out there. So I looked into it. It's called uh, Western Academy. It's still around. Um, and, yeah, it was like an eight-month course or something. But about three months in, I was offered an internship. I took it, and that company offered me a job, and I kind of moved around a little bit, sort of a— what, Prince Albert, Saskatoon, Rosetown, Swift Current, Fort McMurray, Victoria, Calgary, Victoria, Edmonton kind of thing. So with a lot of people in radio, they all kind of follow that same pattern. And I can imagine that it comes with a lot of struggles. Like when you intern, you're not necessarily making an income, but you're doing it to, to do it for future lane kind of thing. What was that journey like? And if somebody else is going through the same process, what advice would you give to them? Well, my thought was that I would front load my career because, you know, you have to invest in your career in order to reap the benefits. And a lot of people, you know, they'll put in, you know, eight and a half or nine hour days and, you know, kind of eight hours for their job and then an extra half hour for their career or an extra hour for their career. And I didn't have any kids, any commitments or any money. So, you know, I didn't really have anything else to do. So you know, I was putting in 12 hour days, sometimes 16 hour days and you know, a lot of those hours were, were me hours. They were, you know, learning how to run a Pro Tools rig, um, you know, emceeing shows, meeting people, you know, that kind of thing. You know, learning a lot of production stuff, really. Because, again, while I'm, you know, a, a hobbyist musician, the mixing side of things is still very much a hobby of mine. So I continue to learn and, you know, take courses and workshops and stuff to grow that side of my skill set. That's awesome. That's uh, really relatable. Like for myself right now in my own career, I've found I can put in a lot of long days to develop my skills and stuff. I don't have any kids or a wife or even a girlfriend now. And uh, you single ladies, (laughs) ladies, (laughs) but um, it's 2018, whatever. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, now, um, so it's just, it's about investing in yourself, knowing that in the future that it'll pay off. Um, 
So what would you say is one of the biggest or the very biggest obstacle that you faced amidst all of this stuff? Honestly, health challenges. I, uh, you know, was sort of on the way up young in my career and uh, I developed some autoimmune issues, some undiagnosed stuff. And I found that exercise helped and I found that eating clean helped because I'm really not a sports guy at all. And next thing you know, oh, look, I'm in shape. <laughs> so what we're like, tell us about how you discovered these audio, autoimmune diseases. Like usually somebody is like, well, something's wrong. Like how did, how did that process happen? Well, I went from working, you know, 14 or 16 hours a day to sleeping 14 or 16 hours a day. And I just couldn't keep up. And, you know, at the time I was eating pretty much nothing but craft dinner because that's what you can afford on radio. <laughs> radio money. And, you know, so I sort of thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm new to exercise. Maybe I'm not getting enough protein or maybe I'm not getting enough vitamins or maybe I'm this or maybe I'm that. And uh, I actually just sort of followed a sort of a diet out of a fitness magazine that said, you know, you want to put on some, some muscle, eat 3000 calories a day and, you know, 200 grams of protein or whatever it happened to be. And uh, I lost like 80 pounds or something in three months, like it fell off. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I found myself really worn out, went into the doctor and, you know, they're like, you know, your liver's failing, like this is happening, this is happening. And it was kind of, you know, they kind of figured they knew what it was and they kept trying to diagnose it. And it's kind of, they just ruled out all of the serious stuff, but all of the symptoms were still there and the markers and the you know, my blood work and all that kind of thing, which are still there. You know, I've, I went to the Mayo Clinic uh, three years ago, three and a half years ago, four years ago now, I guess. Uh, you know, spent a five-figure sum of my own money to try and sort it out. And really nothing's kind of worked in that regard, you know. So I didn't find any relief from painkillers or any kind of medication like that. But I do find that Eating clean and exercise makes a really big difference. So it's kind of, that's your key motivator. There's no, there's no getting out. You're locked in. Like you, you almost are, you need to be exercising kind of thing. It's not so much a choice. It's just a necessity kind of thing. Hey. Oh yeah. And that's, that's good in a way because, uh, it's really good to see people understanding the benefits for their life of good fitness, good nutrition, like putting actual quality food into their body because it helps with so many like relationships, career stuff, keeps you, helps you keep a clear head. What's it like to uh, be of that mindset amidst so many people in radio that might not share the same ideologies? See, that that's the hardest part, I think. You know, I, uh, I have no trouble adhering to a clean diet and stuff for myself, but, you know, you go on a road trip or something – it's really hard to find healthy food on the road. You know, like uh, I go visit my folks in Saskatchewan. I drive through Lloyd Minster and, well, I'm just going to stop and grab a bite to eat. It's like, ugh, you know, where do you go? You know, you got to like find a deli and find some cooked chicken breasts and then well, maybe grab some veggies and dip. And then, well, you need some clean carbohydrates. And that's sort of the toughest part, you know, because there really isn't a, a whole lot out there in that in that realm, you know, it's hard to find cooked yams or millet or uh, oatmeal or brown rice, you know, when you're traveling. Have you learned any pro tips over the years for like what you do if you know you're going to travel? Do you meal prep? I fast. Oh, man. <laughs> I uh, honestly like I'll pack uh, I'll pack a whole bunch of egg whites and stuff when I go somewhere or, you know, fruit and, and that kind of thing. But for the most part, if I can't get what I need, I'll. I'll forego and make up for it by increasing my diet the following week. That's intense, but I like it. Like it's, there's good merit to all of those strategies and you're keeping yourself balanced and stable and healthy and happy. Um, have you found that your attitude has influenced other people around you to be more fit? Definitely. Um, you know, I hate saying this cause it sounds like a brag, but it, like a lot of people have found it, you know, sort of inspiring. Um, about three years ago, um, I'd put on a bunch of weight because, uh, well, for various reasons, but, you know, along with this whole autoimmune thing, uh, they found a, a cyst in my stomach and they had to pull that out and it was six pounds. Like it was huge. 
like, you know, big 15 inch incision across my stomach and they had to sever uh, one of the blood supplies to my cell, uh, my stomach. So basically the other blood supply will grow to compensate, but you know, I wasn't really hungry for any kind of food or anything like that. I had trouble di- uh, digesting stuff like cruciferous vegetables and, you know, legumes and that sort of thing. And I had to eat a little more simply. So I put on some weight, you know, about 60, 70 pounds. Um, and then after I kind of got past that, you know, maybe a year later, I was kind of feeling a little better. And I, I was working out as soon as I could get back to the gym after, like I had six weeks where I could only lift 10 pounds, but probably three months later, I was back to deadlifting, you know, four or 500 pounds kind of thing. But when I went back to the gym, I went back as a 270 pound man, you know, that looked like every other dad in the world, you know, (laughs) male pattern baldness and, you know, gut hanging out of your shorts a little bit. And three months later, I just dialed my diet back in and, shredded down like really quickly. And I think a lot of people found that sort of inspiring, but a lot of people think that that happens in the gym and the gym part of it is essential. Don't get me wrong, but the diet is everything. Yeah. I think for you having like nutrition in your wheelhouse, like that's a skill. Like I'm, I'm hearing all the things that you're saying and you're very proficient with food that goes in your body and like timing and all that stuff. That's like the key. You can train the crap out of somebody you can put them through a rigorous routine. You can have them train like six times a week, but if they're putting crap in their body or if they're like eating too much or if their stress level, sleep level isn't perfect, then they're not going to see success. Um, do you find that, uh, you have any trouble sleeping at all or you got that down pat? Uh, back and forth, you know, I, I've got a three-year-old now, so <laughs> that'll you do know, it. like that'll I've got monsters up. and stuff to deal with in the middle of the night. <laughs> What's your strategy? Give us some advice for the parents that are listening. What's meal prep. Pro tips? Meal prep. Oh yeah. Like every Sunday, you know, my, uh, my little three-year-old night, it's like we, we hit Costco and grab a pile of meat. We go to H and W and grab a pile of veggies. And I do, I prep like a ton, you know, I, uh, I brine a lot of my meat because I feel like it digests a little bit better. The salt kind of helps break it down. I probably eat more salt than I should, but, uh, yeah, I, I meal prep not just for myself, but for her as well. And I mean, she's a kid, so, you know, while I make her, you know, quinoa and veggies and meat and that kind of thing, she'll have, you know, a granola bar with it and a fruit cup and uh, 99 Skittles. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm not strict with how I feed her, but I'm strict about her eating her healthy food besides. What's her favorite meal? What's something that she's like, I want to eat this? Depends on the week. Uh, <laughs> uh, last week it was, you know, quinoa and veggies. The week before it was spicy rice. The week before it was spaghetti, you know. But again, a lot of people say, well, I, I don't have time to eat healthy and that kind of thing. And I definitely don't have time. But what I prep for my lunch is huge. Like my lunch is probably 3,000 calories. So would you say you have like lunch is like your main meal of the day or are you taking in a lot of calories per day? I'm taking in probably 5,000 a day. Um, My breakfast is big. Um, Like I do sort of three eggs, half liter egg whites, uh, just regular breakfast cereal, whatever's cheap and plentiful, like granola, you know, something with some heft to it, but a little bit of sugar too. Um, And then 2% milk. And that's sort of my, my junkiest meal of the day. Because I'm heading right to the gym after eating that. Then during my workout, I drink uh, dextrin, uh, highly branched cyclic dextrin, like just sort of uh, it's basically corn sugar that uh, doesn't raise your blood sugar. So it digests instantly. I mix it up in like a, I don't know, like a little pop bottle. And then I just dose it into my water. And I drink probably three or four liters of water during a workout. I have that in branched chain amino acids and then a whey protein shake after. And then I roll in here to the station, and first thing I do is I eat a liter of oatmeal with a little bit of peanut butter, a can of tuna, two pieces of fruit, handful of nuts. Two hours later, a piece of beef or pork with uh, two cups of millet or brown rice or quinoa. Then whichever one of those I don't have, I usually have in the next meal two hours later. 
with chicken and like tons of veggies with all of those. You know, even my eggs in the morning, like big handful of spinach, like half of what I eat is probably veggies. But that's all what I've eaten before five o'clock. That's awesome. Like to think that this all came from you reading one magazine and it just built up from there. Who would you say are your three top influencers for fitness and nutrition? Hmm. I hate to say it. I don't really have any. Like I, I kind of figured it out in the worst way. Well, you know what? Uh, there's a trainer at the gym. I can't remember his last name. Uh, Antonio. He's a sprints trainer. He's probably about my age. Um, he's very big on eating whole foods. And, you know, he's a guy who'll say, yep, take in more calories. But for him, it's, well, grind up a yam in the blender and, you know, throw a couple eggs in there. Like it's all real food for him. But, you know, the guy's half my size and twice as strong. <laughs> he's like an ant. <laughs> yeah. That was cool. Like having actual genuine conversations, like understanding that we don't alone know all the answers. So like ask people, like make, make connections and stuff like that. And I believe in that too. Like there's just like, there's a lot of radio DJs in town and some might have like an answer for like how to put some audio together trainers. It's good to have trainers like building off of each other because each one is going to have a skill set to build them up or like something that they have personal experience with. Like there's trainers in town that have like slipped disc, slipped discs in their back and they, they have personal experience in like why you shouldn't deadlift this way or how, how to brace your core and stuff like that. Um, do you do a lot of Googling or are you more of a book guy? Um, (laughs) it sounds funny, but when I first started exercising, I bought this book by Frank Seppi called the truth. And, uh, it says on the cover, the last fitness book you'll ever need. And it's literally the last one I bought, and I bought it 20 years ago. But it just had, uh, you know, a whole bunch of exercise in it for one. And uh, then it had nutrition tips. And, again, that was sort of – he was big in the whole, you know, eat 3,000 calories a day and do cardio every day and that kind of thing. And I found that, well, the tips were valid. Diet is a very personal thing, person to person. You know, what works for some people at 3,000 calories a day – like I found I needed almost twice that amount of food just to keep meat on my bones. Well, plus you're, you're a big dude. Like you're pretty much twice the size of me. So <laughs> for anybody listening, like it's no, it's no question he needs to eat a lot of calories. There's, there's a lot of volume too. You're doing a lot of like heavy weights. So it all makes sense. But it, it's cool that you're be able to intuitively train, intuitively eat, like understand like what the facts are out there and apply it to your body in a smart way. Because with all the different diet fads, like you talked about fasting, and then there's there's tons, there's so many different options, and people are always asking like nutrition coaches, like is this is this a thing? Should I be doing this? And it's like, well, what's what's right for your body? What works? The one thing that I've really found has made a huge difference is loading your calories around your active part of the day. Like I think about uh, fat as being, you know, the energy source for you know your breathing, your heart you know, sort of your body processes and then carbohydrates as being the fuel for, you know, your, your output. And so, you know, some people are saying, oh, keto is just the magic bullet. It's like, if you're inactive, it's like, well, yeah, cause you don't need carbohydrates if you're not doing anything, you know, or you need very few and yeah. slow digesting carbohydrates. Whereas if you're really active, you know, there's a lot of nights I don't eat supper. You know, I get till to five o'clock. I've had my giant lunch. You know, I drank my sugar water during my workout I mean, I might be at the gym from, say, 11 to 1. I've ingested 70% of my calories within two hours of that on either side. You know, I, I don't need to be, you know, throwing down a whole bunch of macaroni before bed or chips or anything like that. And people think it's discipline, but the truth is if you eat, you know, 4,500 calories or 4,200 calories before 5 o'clock – You'll be amazed at how little supper you want or how snacky you are towards the end of the day. Yeah, there's definitely some some great merit to that. Like, it, it makes sense to me, too. I find if I have a big meal during the day, like, I honestly don't really need food later on. And I think about what I ate during the day, and I, I understand why I don't need to snack. Because, like, I had a good volume of food, and I only did so much exercise, and it all balances out. But... We got to move on from fitness because people are going to think this is an exclusively fitness podcast. <laughs> but uh, 
We're going to take it into the, the family aspect of things because you brought up your daughter a few times. Yeah. You, you strike me as a family man. Um, what measures do you take in your busy life to ensure there is a healthy balance between work and family? And what is something that you look forward to doing each week with your daughter? Uh, we go swimming just about every week. Um, or we do gymnastics on uh, Saturday mornings, which is tons of fun. She loves it. And I, you know, go through and do the little demonstrations and stuff with her. Like it's just somersaults and lifting and that kind of thing. And I was thinking about this. Um, when I was a little kid, one of the things I totally loved was playing ring around the rosy. And whenever adults would do it with you, it was like the best thing ever. And, you know, you come home from work and you're tired and you just want to sit down and that sort of thing. But 15 minutes is really all it takes of undivided attention to, you know, let your little one know that they, they matter. You know, it's something as simple as, okay, we're doing Ring Around the rosy, and uh, it's bath night. We're having a bath party. We're going to put on the Bluetooth speaker and, uh, you know, throw some, uh, what are those, like little glow sticks in the bathtub. And it's like, hey, look, it's a bath party. It's like, it's 15 minutes. I love it. And, like, especially at the age she's at now, like, I like to think that it's about three when people really start to build those memories and for myself, like reflecting back to my childhood, I think like some of the most pivotal times in my life were like just that little thing that an adult, like an uncle, an aunt, mom, dad, older brother did during that time. And it's so great to hear that you're, you're having those one-on-one -on -one times. You mentioned gymnastics. Do you have like a background? Did you do gymnastics as oh, a kid? Oh God, no, no, I'm terrible at every sport. I tried them all and I'm bad at every single one of them, but, uh, I did think that putting her in gymnastics, uh, it was actually her mom's idea, but putting her in gymnastics young, I thought would benefit her, you know, for all of the other stuff. Like I struggle with flexibility and, uh, you know, I do yoga and that kind of thing recreationally, usually seniors yoga <laughs> to like a wreck. That works, man. You know, because it's, it's recovery for me and just stretching. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I think that'll sort of help her with whatever sort of fitness goals she has down the road, you know. I don't imagine she's going to be a gymnast or anything, not if she has, you know, my sort of predisposition for sports. But, you know, like even stuff like being a, a goalie in hockey or swimming or diving or any of that stuff, you know, flexibility is essential. Weightlifting. Yeah, it teaches really good body awareness. Like everybody that I know that's highly proficient in gymnastics has excelled in any sport endeavor that they do because when they – they understand which, what different muscles in their body do, and they understand how to get into certain positions. So they're more likely to maintain that neutral position. They're more likely to move to a different direction with proficiency kind of thing. So it's such a, a good thing to have any kid start up in, especially if like it's a good atmosphere and not like too competitive. You're still able to have positive association with it. Um, has there ever been a time where like work got in the way or have you been on top of that the whole, the whole way through? I think I've gotten better at it, you know, but, uh, like, um, her mother and I are no longer together and we, uh, we sort of trade days, but we each kind of have a weekend day. So I try and plan some sort of activity for, you know, our day together. And then the rest of it, she kind of hangs out with me and we, you know, when I mow the lawn, she brings out her bubble mower and that's awesome. <laughs> and pushes that around, and, and so it's not all play. But I mean, when it's not, it's like she's right there with me, helping out and and trying to make beds. And <laughs> <laughs> I love it. What's the biggest personal struggle you've had to overcome aside from the health? And if you could give younger Lane one piece of advice to help get through that time, what would you say? So you don't have to like be specific or anything, but just that piece of advice. Hmm. What's something that contributes to your resiliency? Because you strike me as a very resilient person. I don't know. Uh, I think getting divorced was really tough. And uh, not that I ever thought that I would get divorced, but, you know, I've, I've met a lot of divorced people over the years. And, you know, somebody says, oh, we're getting divorced. You know, I always thought it's like, well, it's like when you break up with your boyfriend or your girlfriend or that sort of thing. And I don't think I, I gave it the, uh, the weight that I should have, you know, when they told me about that, because that probably was the toughest thing that I've ever been through. And I think the advice I would 
say. It's not so much advice, but just believe that it'll get better because it will. I like that. Just having that positive attitude. Like, if we have control over one thing, it's basically how we see our situation. Yeah. So if if we're down in the dumps about the inevitable things that are out of our control, like how we interact with other people, we're never going to know how that uh, turns out or what's going to happen. So if we have control of one thing, it's basically how we see our situation. Like people, people lose loved ones to cancer. People have breakups. All these different things happen in life. And it, it's so great to hear your attitude and that you've, you've learned that lesson kind of thing. Well, I think having a, a little one too, um, you know, it forces healthy habits you know, it would have been real easy without her around to, you know, kind of choose a different path for, you know, dealing with a struggle like that. But I think you got to keep it together when you have a little one. And just having faked it, <laughs> you know, which is really what I did to get through it, you know, now things are much better. They're better than they were before. But, you know, I didn't really... I probably wouldn't have gotten to that point, you know, were it not for the healthy habits that I just needed to have in place. Yeah. She was your little accountability buddy. Yeah. That'll be awesome. Growing older, you'll have like a unique relationship that a lot of parents and their children don't have, which is going to be exciting. You'll, you'll grow old, be that close, close dad, daughter kind of set that guy beating up her boyfriends <laughs> can see it now. <laughs> yeah. You probably already have the baseball bats purchased and shined up, ready to go. Um, so we all have a big goal in mind, something that we want to accomplish that seems a little out of reach, but we want it so bad that it's essentially what motivates us each day. And a lot of the time, the big goal is something that we don't like. Nobody really knows about our big goal, but back of the mind, everybody has it. What would you say yours is? You know, um, it sounds like a cop-out, but just being a good parent right now. Like, um, I think I'm realistic about the fact that, you know, I, I need my, my exercise and my meal prep and all that kind of thing to keep my health on track. And, you know, I, parenting takes up a lot of my time. And so between those two things, I don't have a lot of extra hours to pour into my career right now, which is why it was handy to front load it. You know, I put the time in when I could. And I'm still benefiting from that. In fact, I'm able to put in probably less hours now than, you know, I otherwise would have, you know, because I'm, I'm efficient with it. You know, when I go to put together a promo or a commercial or something, you know, it takes less time. I can do it quicker and more decisively because I, I've got that experience now. But uh, just being a good parent is kind of my focus right now. Makes sense. And that's admirable. Um, what does your best life look like to you? Like if you could change all the variables, if you had control over what you did every day, what would every day look like? Hmm. I think I would just remove the clocks from it because I feel like I'm really busy right now and I like all of the things that I do. I love all of the things that I do, but you know, usually when I'm leaving to drop my daughter off at day home in the morning, I feel like we're running late. Then I get to the gym and I feel like I'm getting a late start. Then I feel like I'm getting to work late because (laughs) I was running late at the gym. You know, then I, you know, working till seven o'clock too. And most people work till five. And I feel like I'm late getting home and then late getting to bed. (laughs) And then I do it all over again the next day. (laughs) Holy crap. Does that put you into a bit of a stressed mentality or are you pretty calm? Um, I think I got to figure out some better ways to deal with it. But what I have realized is that the difference between... Rushing and not rushing is negligible. You know, if I'm rushing from the gym to get to work, if I drive a little bit faster or, you know, try and race through showering and all that kind of thing and getting dressed as quick as I can, really, I I race through the whole day. It makes about 15 minutes difference. So at that point, you kind of go, maybe I'll just take my time and, you know, pick that one 15 minute task and move it to the next day or schedule a a different day to get it done or hire someone to do it. You know, any, any way you can kind of make it work. Makes sense. And, uh, what I found in my experience with training clients that have had to travel the white mud on the way to the gym, um, you gotta like implement that time to just like take a breath, chill out. And like, 
Breathing is something that's so underrated, but to get like a good quality intra-abdominal breath in through the nose, out through the mouth, sometimes they call it box breathing, they call it meditative breathing. I'm sure I've mispresented it or uh, said it wrong, but like just get that whole nervous system calmed down. You, you can't do that enough. So if you ever find like you're in traffic and you're, you're uptight and, and whatever, like uh, take a big breath in through your nose and then out through the mouth and like do five of those and you're rolling. You're, you're like, it's the best thing you could possibly do. Um, would you say that up to this point you've had any strategies? Do you do meditation? Do you do like the quiet uh, yoga, anything like that? Or Not really. I, like I, I do yoga sort of as a hobby never more than twice a week but more like once every two weeks it's not near as often as i'd like um but yeah breathing is key and i feel like i'd find a little more peace in my life if i if i did that you know because i do have a, a busy busy life you know when i'm downstairs in the morning i'm you know packing up my lunch like even though everything's meal prepped it's kind of this from this fridge and this from this fridge and <laughs> You know, you're putting it all together and, you know, my daughter wants me to hold her with one arm and it's like the <laughs> coffee kettle's whistling and, you know, I've got eggs in the microwave that are overflowing and all that kind of thing. It's all going on at once. And I think that uh, the breathing is important. And I think that uh, even doing, you know, like I said, you know, seniors yoga or, you know, sit and be fit even, you know, it's its own sort of form of meditation. You know, it can be formal meditation if you're good at it. I'm not. Yeah. It, it takes, like, a really well-trained mind to do that. I could never actually put myself through meditation. I've uh, tried some healing, some energy healing. That was pretty neat. Um, I definitely benefit from, like, the yoga classes where they let you just lay on your back because they just have a way of, like, directing your breath and stuff like that. But, like, it's such an important thing to implement that, especially for someone busy like yourself. Like, it took us, like, couple weeks to nail down this time because your routine is just full like you're busiest dude that I've talked to in a <laughs> while which is awesome because at the same time you made time for this which is like I appreciate it big time um being in radio you have to have met some famous people who's the most famous person you've come across see most famous or the most memorable who stands out that is like man that was so cool that I met that person or those people kind of thing Hmm. A lot of different ones for different reasons. Um, you know, most famous is probably Chad from Nickelback, who, you know, everybody in the world's met, you know, because <laughs> they, they toured for like, you know, 20 years before they sort of took off, you know. But uh, he's definitely a, a pretty famous dude now. Chris Cornell. Okay, there we go. Chester Bennington. Yeah. Ryan Reynolds. That's a pretty yeah. star-studded list. But, well, Ryan Reynolds, though, it was, I think it was for Blade 2 or maybe Blade 3. Um, so he was basically just the guy from Two Guys, A Girl, in a Pizza Place. <laughs> you know? it's, it's all about timing, like when you meet yeah. them and stuff like that. What was it like meeting uh, Chester Bennington? Yeah, he was really chill. Like he was just a, a super nice guy. You know, I... Uh, it was sort of a festival interview, right? And it was off-site. It was at uh, Rexall Place when we were doing Sonic Boom at uh, Northland still. Okay. So, yeah, like we rode the little golf cart over there. And, you know, Lincoln Park just had, I don't know, Rexall set up as like their dressing room. Like there's guys playing basketball and stuff in the hallways. And we go in there and it's just like, oh, hey, man, how's it going? Yeah, I love it. That was like because I went to Sonic Boom, I think, like the next year or something like that. And I had so many regrets for having missed that year because like Lincoln Park was a band that I always wanted to see and then uh, I think the next time they came to Edmonton or maybe like the second time after they had their concert scheduled and then they had to cancel because of somebody's illness or something so tickets got refunded I think that must have been how it played out because I remember buying tickets and then I got refunded and I was like damn it <laughs> and I'd like watch to see when they came through and I might have missed it or something but uh, I just I was like I was so close I was so close to seeing them and I missed out. It was just, it was something something that struck me because uh, just I really resonated with the the messages that Linkin Park put out. Like it's, uh, if you listen to the lyrics, like it's very like mental health oriented kind of thing. Like yeah. just deep thoughts. So I think it's really cool that you met him. And like if he 
if he struck you as somebody that was like a true to himself kind of person, then that's a pretty cool way to remember a person. Because like some some musicians, do you ever come across somebody that uh, they put on this facade? They seem like such a nice guy, like on the radio or like in public on when they're recorded, when when they have an audience. But then behind the scenes, they're a complete jerk. Have you come across anybody like that? Mm. No, like some people put it on more than others. Um, like I remember the very first time I met Biff Naked. Um, she just walked into the studio, like, while I was on air, and she walked up and put her gum in my mouth. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which was very punk rock, but it felt kind of flirtatious. And on the radio, she was kind of flirtatious with me. And we turned off the microphones, and that totally ended. And it was very professional. Like, it was sort of interesting because it was sort of like, you know, this is, this is my persona, and this is just me. Yeah. Yeah. It was just like all of a sudden the microphones came off and it's like, hey, I'm Beth. <laughs> <laughs> That's a story. Yeah. <laughs> like 20 years ago now. but <laughs> So badass. Makes it worth it to be in an industry like this where it's not necessarily easy, but you have better stories than anybody else kind of thing. There's some fun ones. What a takeaway. So back on to food. What's your favorite s- source of protein? If you could eat one source of protein for the rest of your life, what would it be? Probably eggs. They're just eggs. so easy. Complete protein. Are you the kind of person that just does eggs whites? Egg whites or you use the whole damn egg? Well, I was just doing egg whites, but uh, this sprints coach at uh, Terwilliger that I chat with from time to time, he's like, oh, no, you, you need some eggs. If you need more calories, you know, like he's a guy who'll walk by me and look at me and go, you're flat today. You need to eat more, <laughs> you know? And so, yeah, I threw in, you know, three eggs a day, it's 21 eggs a week. It's significant, right? And I lost three pounds. <laughs> I'm kind of like, what the hell? <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I'm like, a, I'm a big advocate of eat the whole damn egg. Like, I know a lot of people that'll just do the egg whites, and there's, there's reason and logic to it. But if you think about it, like that egg turns into a whole being kind of thing. Like, there's so many nutrients to it that you're missing out if you take out the yolk. Whether it be you're worried about how many calories there is, it's just worth it to like if you can fit that into how many calories you're gonna have, eat the whole damn egg. That, that's my resounding message for anybody listening. Um, if you could clar- clarify or classify something as a binge meal, what would it be? What would be like your treat, even if it's still a little bit healthy? Mm. I don't know. It, it's funny. You know, I, I really don't, I don't crave anything. And I know that sounds weird, but part of it's maybe that I'm missing <laughs> half the blood supply to my stomach. The other half is just that I eat a lot, but you know, between those two things, I really don't, uh, I don't ever sort of cheat on my diet so much, but, uh, I do, um, I do drink scotch, which there we go. Yeah. But I mean, that's almost not, a <laughs> it's not a binge meal, but <laughs> I'm going to count it, man. Like it's something, Yeah, but it is, it is something that's sort of uh, off menu and it's not a whole food. Yeah. Yeah. That's neat. Uh, do you have a specific brand that you like? Um, Glen Morangi, I like, uh, they have a tenure that's really good. Um, sort of a good price. I don't know. I usually drink cheap stuff and if it's cheap, there's lots of ice. And if it's good, there's no ice. <laughs> Do you have a favorite watering hole that you go for like special occasions to have your, your scotch or whatever? Not usually. I'm more kind of a house party guy. That works. Yeah. That works. That's awesome. So we're going to our last question. The... The final finisher. If you could give our listeners one piece of advice on authentically living their life to the fullest, what would it be? Well, I would say uh, set goals and then make a plan to follow through with them. You know, and I think part of what I realized, you know, getting in shape the first time, because I was kind of a fat kid growing up, but uh, I started going to the gym because a guy at work said, hey, we should go to the gym. You know, we'll get in shape and then we can meet some ladies. And then he stopped showing up and I just kept going. That's always how it works. But, you know, my goal was quite literally, I just want my pants to fit a little bit better. But what I realized with this whole thing is that, you know, if you want to put on weight, you know, like I I used to look at, you know, being in shape or not being in shape. It was like this big mystical thing. And some people are just genetically gifted and that's how it is. But it's not, there's no magic to it, you know, it's... um, 
you know, if you weigh 200 pounds and you want to weigh 210 pounds, you know, a pound is 3,500 calories. You got to eat 3,500 more calories, you know, and that's one pound. Then it's like, add another, <laughs> you know what I mean? You can just sort of break it down and kind of go, well, I want to gain a pound a week for 10 weeks. It's like, well, here's how you do it. You can actually just write down the number. You know, a lot of people just think, well, you know, it's, I don't know, they, they perceive it as being a, an unattainable thing, but it's so measurable. Yeah. It's like, you know, you go for a run, you burned off 300 calories, and then you probably burned off another 300 over the next 24 hours, you know, recovering from it. So there's 600 more calories you can eat or, you know, less you can, uh, you know, you can sort of create your caloric deficit if you want to lose weight, either by exercising or by diet or a little bit of both. And it's really, but it, it goes to show you, you know, you set a goal and then you can just sort of map out how to get there very easily. And I mean, that's a career thing too. Yep. You know, if I want to do mornings in Toronto, you know, well, meet some program directors in Toronto, start networking, you know, start sending them tapes, you know, uh, start, um, you know, creating a, a relationship there, you know, talk with uh, my boss here, say, well, we've got some stations in Toronto, like who's the guy over there? You know, like there's, there's always things you can do that bring you closer to your goal. I agree completely. So many people are like, well, it's not possible. And it's like, well, pretty much if you say you can do it, that's, that's the only thing you need to do. And then you just do the little steps that get you there. Yeah. I like it. That's great advice. Well, I'd like to thank you again for joining me. Oh, thanks for six. having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.